seriously didn't think that anybody was going to see these films outside Italy. And I quite hope that they wouldn't, in actual fact. Um, especially when uh, a few years later, uh, I was told, and not, not, that, not that long afterwards, but a, a few years, and my, my brother said to me, there's a big conference in London and, uh, uh, about violent cinema, and uh, they're discussing 10 films, and you're starring in two of them. I decided when I was five years old that I wanted to be a ballerina and I stuck with that decision and I went through the arduous training of uh, becoming a ballerina and I went to, it's called the Royal Ballet School, it's a bit like the, the Paris Opera School, it's one of the best schools in the world, very difficult to get into and um, being a ballerina is um, a bit like being a sportsman or a sportswoman, it's uh, very very difficult and it's a short-lived career and in fact destiny took over in so much as I got an injury and I had to stop dancing and I met uh, what you could describe as a, a wild child of French theatre who was a quite a, quite a famous writer director at that time in the 70s and uh, he was looking for somebody who could dance in a play and uh, that it was quite easy what I had to do so it, it was, didn't hurt my injury very much so I decided to do that and when I was w with this theatre company I, I realised that I was actually much happier with theatre people and uh, the business actors, uh, directors mm -hmm. in that respect than with these rather um, one directional obsessive neurotic dancers. An Italian agent who was a very large personality, a friend of Lucio's, went to London looking for a blonde, blue-eyed, slightly Hitchcockian type actress. And my English agent rang me up and said, um, they've gone back to Rome with a selection of photographs and they've chosen yours and they want you to go to Rome to meet this director called Lucio Fulci. Our first meeting was um, incredibly official in so much as it took place in a very beautiful palazzo, palace, which was the office of this uh, rather decadent, uh, well-known Italian agent, uh, the same one that had gone to London. And Lucia was dressed in um, a kind of British way. I don't, I don't think it was a homage to me already because I'd never met him before, but he was dressed in a sort of tweed jacket and uh, uh, tweed trousers. And of course he had his pipe. Uh, so, and he didn't actually uh, say terribly much. He, often didn't say terribly much, I, I realized later. Uh, so he was incredibly well behaved, incredibly clean for once, which he didn't, didn't have a very uh, good reputation for being clean. And then he gave me the script at the end of the meeting and I was leaving the following morning and he said, uh, I want you to read the script tonight and tell me what you think about it before you leave. And you know, tell me if you accept it. So, went back to the hotel, read the script. First thing the next morning, rang my agent and said, I'm not at all sure that this is a very good idea if I do this because uh, A, it didn't read very well. I realized later possibly it was a translation and it was a very bad translation. Uh, the characters had not much substance, so I was thinking, what am I going to do with this character? And then I thought, well, let me go through it again. So I went through all the pages again to see um, exactly what I had to do in my character. And I realized that most, most of the really horrible special effects didn't happen to my character. So I was thinking, oh, well, that's OK then. All I really have to do is be scared and scream and this. And uh, my agent when I, when I spoke to him, came up with the, the famous, the, f the few famous phrases that I've often repeated. He, you know, he said, do, do, do you want to go to America? And in those days, it was, was really exciting to, to go to America. You couldn't go like you can now with cheap flights and things. And so I said, yes. And, and he said, do you, uh, do you want to stay in Rome for eight or nine weeks? I said, well, yes, of course. And he said, do you have any other projects at the moment? No, not really. And uh, do you need the money? And uh, yes, of course. And he said, well, you know, just do it. No one will ever see it. When you were in this trance, did you see anything besides that tombstone? Oh, yes. 
I saw a priest who, by hanging himself, opened the gates of hell. The days were long and uh, packed tight. Um, I seem to remember very often the sort of nastier effects were done towards the end of the day and there was always pressure from the producer that, you know, we had to finish, etc. So, uh, no, it was, uh, it was quite difficult. Before I flew away, so to speak, uh, they wanted me to do the necessary dubbing, which actually meant dubbing the whole film. I, and because they hadn't chosen the shots at that time, it was literally at the end of the shooting, I had to dub every shot. So I can't tell you how many times I screamed because uh, as in all the films, there are various screaming sequences, but you know, sometimes there were 12 takes. So as they hadn't chosen them, I was dubbing, dubbing every single take. <laughs> I remember going to see um, the first one, uh, um, Fear, or whatever it's many titles, La Paura, uh, in London in a cinema. I kind of almost went in disguise, you know, almost in a raincoat, with, but not quite, but almost. Uh, and I took my mother, or, uh, poor mother, and brother with me, and we went on a Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock, and there was about eight people. We were three, about five others in the cinema. And I sat in the back row, uh, pretending it wasn't really me. And uh, I spent half the movie like this, saying to my brother, you know, don't look now, something horrible's going to happen. <laughs> Beyond, regarding the beyond, what did you first think about the script? Well, I didn't think too much of the script, to be absolutely honest again. I didn't particularly like, I still don't particularly like, because it's particularly horrific, but it, the beginning of the movie, you know, when he gets crucified or, or on the wall, um, it's, it's very well done, but it's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I liked the character very much that I had to play. I, I liked her more than the one in uh, La Paura, Fear. But, and if, if I had to say, she's probably the one that resembles me the most, although I have the qualities of the others. Um, she's the one that I relate to the most. So, what did you do in The Big Apple? Just about everything a girl could do, without losing her good English breeding and reputation. Modeling, dancing, secretary. I almost became an unsuccessful fashion designer. The picture was supposed to be uh, an American uh, picture, so to speak. I, I know uh, part of its success is uh, that it's trying to be an American picture, but it isn't. You know, it's an Italian picture, really, except that everybody's speaking English with sort of slightly strange American accents sometimes. Martin, I've already told you I don't have the money. Do whatever you want to do as long as it doesn't cost. I have carte blanche? Carte blanche, but not a blank check, okay? Okay. The French Quarter was wonderful. We, we, were, we did get to go to a jazz, co traditional New Orleans jazz concert in, uh, in Bourbon Street. Um, oh, it's beautiful, really beautiful. But, you know, we were there to do a job, so... Uh, uh, I was kind of very concentrated on the scenes that we were we were doing. Again, we had uh, various uh, people that were brought into the crew who were from there. Um, I have thought of them since because of the terrible hurricane Katrina that went through New Orleans. I, I, I wondered if certain places that we'd been to were still standing and uh, what had happened to those lovely people that uh, worked with us. There was this um, house which does still exist because I've re recently been sent a photograph of it, uh, Emily's house, in, in fact, which was an incredible uh, location. Pretty Baby, Louis Mal's film was shot there as well with Brooke Shields and Susan Sarandon. Uh, so I was, and I, I had seen that Pretty Baby, so I was kind of uh, honored to be shooting uh, in the same place because uh, I, I loved uh, that film and Louis Mal's films particularly. And you know, that, that particular house had an incredibly sort of opulent vegetation. It looks completely different now. The house is still standing. There is no vegetation at all. So of course it's lost most of its uh, charm. The house, my house, the hotel, in other words, 
was uh, across this huge bridge called Pontchartrain Bridge, which at that time I think was possibly the longest bridge in the world. I, it probably isn't anymore, but it, it was you know, miles to get across the, across the, the, the whatever it was, the bayou to the other side. So it would take quite a long time every morning going to the location in itself. There's a certain challenge in certain of these uh, scenes, whether they are being buried alive in a coffin or being blasted by worms or whatever it is. You, 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 you want to make it credible. And as the special effects were kind of uh, first degree in those days, uh, they were brilliant, of course, but they were what I would call sort of first degree. You know, we didn't have the technology then that, that you do now. Therein, to a certain degree, lies the charm that these special effects were, were, were real. Obviously, the end of the beyond, we have all the zombies, like the zombie walk, as I call it. And um, their makeup sessions were quite extraordinary. They took quite a long time. And I was at makeup at seven o'clock in the morning with a few zombies beside me who I was told made a career out of playing zombies. They were film extras and that's what, that's what they did. Uh, but I, I always remember at the end of this um, wonderful sort of makeup that uh, De Rossi was doing, he just picked up a, 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 a pot of marmalade, a jam, and poured it over the zombie's head. And of course it all sort of soaked down. And uh, I just thought this was hysterically funny. You know, at the end of this very complicated makeup, he just took the jam and poured it over his head, and it was very effective. This way. I guess in the beyond, uh, it got a little difficult after a number of days down in the flooded basement. You know, that was a little bit difficult because it was a restricted space. There was a lot of us there. There was this smelly water, it, were, you know, it was damp, it was humid, it was towards the end of the shoot. And we were on these uh, planks and we had to be careful not to, not to fall. It wasn't very deep, but it wasn't very nice, this, this water. When you're making very dark pictures, you have to have a laugh in between takes and offset. And uh, the beyond, so that was David Warbeck, and David Warbeck had a huge sense of humor, bless him. And uh, so he would make us laugh like crazy. There were various amusing moments when we would try to uh, change perhaps various elements in the text. And we were quickly, uh, we quickly, we soon realized that we were not allowed to. It's funny because you know, it seemed that the dialogue wasn't that well written. And if, uh, David Warbeck and myself, which happened in the beyond actually, because there's the the, the famous couple Martha and Arthur, and uh, it, uh, Lucio didn't realise that this in English they, it rhymes Martha and Arthur. You know, it's, it sounds like a sort of comedy act, you know, Martha and Arthur. Martha, Arthur, Arthur. David and I were falling about laughing, doing, rehearsing this scene. You know, it was Martha, Arthur, Arthur, Martha. And I, I said to Lucha, I said, I can't do this. I'm going to laugh. You know, this is too funny for words. What do you mean it's funny? And I was saying, well, it's hysterical in English, Arthur and Martha. And of course, in, in uh, Italian, it's Arturo and Marta. So it's not at all the same thing. So when they wrote it, they, they didn't realize how funny this sounded. But anyway, we were told, no, we had to say it. So as we thought nobody would ever see the film, we thought, well, it doesn't matter. You know, we'll just say it. And because we got on particularly well, whatever spark uh, there is, uh, I, you can't, I don't, in my memory, you couldn't really call it a romantic spark, but whatever flirtation or whatever's going on, uh, I guess we put it there. Either I run this hotel, or I go on relief. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. When you get the hotel fixed up, I'll come and stay there, okay? So you can book me a room now. Sure, you got it. The best in the house. Oh, of course. In the third movie, The House by the Cemetery, there I am married to Paolo Malco, and, and Paolo was divine. He was incredibly good looking. We adored each other. Um, you know, we could easily have uh, uh, improvised on, on that level. But uh, no, no, no changes, no improvisation. So um, it's hard to say whether those scenes uh, frightened Lucio. I, I, I can't believe that they did because he made a lot of movies. I mean, he did make some erotic movies, didn't he? Which I've never seen. 
quite what they're like, I have no idea. But uh, so I, I, you know, I don't think anything really frightened Lucio. But there perhaps was a certain discretion on that level. You'd have to ask his daughter, Antonella. She'll tell you. <laughs> I don't really know that anybody, maybe Lucio did, I, I don't know, realized uh, quite what an effect this end scene and this end set was going to have on people. It was the last sequence of the film that we shot. It was just before Christmas. It was something like 20th of, 22nd of December. Uh, it was the last shot of the day, the last scene of the film. And we'd had these um, contact lenses, these white eyes uh, m made for us, but my God, were they painful. They, were, they hurt so much. So that was probably the most difficult thing. So, so we had to put them in. Of course, we couldn't see a thing. So uh, we had to be guided everywhere. And, you know, I was told afterwards, but obviously I would have been horrified at the time, that uh, people were pulled in kind of off the street. Uh, homeless people, you know, were pulled in to be part of that scene. And they were promised to... I don't know what they were promised to drink, maybe, uh, I don't know. So uh, I, I don't actually remember if they were all dummies. I don't think they were all dummies. But it's kind of, it adds to the legend, uh, you know, the Fulci legend. And it wouldn't surprise me. Nothing would surprise me. In this house, what you don't know will hurt you. House. By the cemetery. I, I'm a slight masochist, but I'm not a total masochist. And if I hadn't had fun on these movies, I wouldn't have agreed to do another one. <laughs> and you know, just being with this crew in America, especially in Rome, where they were at home, you know, there is, you, there is, you can't not have fun in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> On all three movies, we did the American uh, shoot first, which usually lasted, if my memory is correct, about uh, three weeks. Um, we didn't go through. We went through New York on the first one. That 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 was fun because we did everything without permission there, and so it was fairly incredible. Uh, that we didn't have problems with the um, syndicates, you know, because uh, we did have problem the unions. We did have problems with them in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, they let down the tires of all the all the technical uh, technical cars and lorries. Uh, uh, we couldn't shoot one day because of that. But um, so, yes, all the American parts were done first, which was a relief in a way because obviously, you know, it was quite far. Got that out the way. Then we came back home to Rome where everyone felt very much at home. And uh, we shot in, each film was shot in De Paoli's studio. And it was uh, hanging on by threads in so much as it was raining through the roof and it, it, it was slightly falling apart at the studio. It, it was okay, but it was at the end of its life, you, you, you could tell. And uh, we would amuse ourselves at lunchtime in the canteen. Uh, I seem to remember that the windows of the canteen, the canteen was in the basement, and the windows were on street level. So we would climb up on tables and uh, call people that were walking past, you know, with these zombies. And of course, you know, everybody would go, ah! And you know, it would make us laugh. So that was lunchtime uh, entertainment. The first shoot was amusing because uh, on one stage, they had uh, Isabella Rossellini making uh, a small Italian comedy. Uh, she, she was running around with angel wings on. She was playing an angel. And at the time, she was with Martin Scorsese. So he was there running around after her. So you had Isabella Rossellini, Martin Scorsese on one, uh, one plot, and all of us with the zombies and the dark side of life on another stage. And of course, we would all meet in the, in the canteen. And it was just... Uh, rather surreal, uh, rather surreal. We didn't really have a lot of time to discuss the motivation of the characters or the sort of emotional content of the scenes. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know maybe some of the Italian actors who, because Lucio's English wasn't that great, okay? So, so communication was sometimes a little bit difficult, but uh, in my memory, it seems to me that it was mostly about blocking. And of course, once we, shot for a few days, I 
think I was in character and it seemed to me that if he didn't say anything then it meant that whatever I was doing was right and I, I, I think that he um, he had quite a lot of confidence in me it, it seemed so it, it, it seemed to me that he, he didn't need to say a great deal to me once I was in character and I, I really felt these characters and I tried to put into them more than was written on the page. I was particularly good at hitting the marks and of course that comes from my, my dance training and I couldn't really understand why other actors found it difficult. You know, if they say, stand there, you stand there. You know, you don't stand, uh, 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 because in choreography you have to all be in a line. In a way, the more physically demanding they were, the more uh, satisfying. It, n n not that I don't get huge satisfaction from in-depth, you know, psychological, emotional scenes as well. Of course, of course, I do. But uh, the physical side is really good fun. I had a very good time. You know, I went to different parts of America that I would never have gone to, uh, perhaps at all. Like you know, Savannah, Georgia. Um, the experience was very interesting. Obviously, I got on incredibly well with all the crew. It was the same crew each time. I absolutely adored being in Rome. And you know, I was paid, which is also sometimes a miracle in, in Italian films in those days. I did get the check, so that's always useful. Well, he was a very complex character, as I said before, and it was hard to get past the, um, the front that he would put on, unless he was screaming. He was you know, either screaming, uh, and then we were in the Italian comedy, <laughs> as far as I was concerned, or he was incredibly uh, dense and intense and not saying very much. So it was a little difficult to understand what was going on behind this front that he put on. He didn't frighten me at all. And although he could be very intimidating and perhaps if he had shouted at me in the way that he treated certain actresses, I might have been intimidated. But I, I really don't think he ever would. There was maybe one, one or two times where he raised his voice a little bit, but it made me laugh rather than anything else. For me, it was like an Italian comedy, you know, everybody was shouting and I, of course I didn't really understand what they were saying either, so that helps. But um, he was a deeply complex character and we, uh, well, we respected each other. I think, I think he respected me because he, he very much respected the, uh, um, the, well, the training of British actors. There was something he respected about the British, well, yes, Anglo-Saxon British as opposed to American, because that's a slightly different way of acting. And uh, he treated me with, with great respect. He, I think he realized that I, I, I well, I hope he realized, I'm sure he realized that I certainly wasn't a bimbo and uh, there was this this problem in those days that it, it, a lot of Italian actresses, I, I, I hope it's changed now, um, it seemed to me were so obsessed with their image as a sort of sexy woman, you know, uh, and maybe the Italian male in the industry and the type of films they were making um, necessitated them to, to, to be like this. So it, it seemed a bit ridiculous that they were, uh, uh, not all of them, but uh, this was the impression that I got, that uh, if they were obsessed with were they looking pretty, were they looking sexy, you know, we're talking about a Lucio Fulci, Fulci horror movie. If he was shouting at actresses, it's because he wasn't getting what he wanted from them. And uh, he, he, he just didn't, didn't respect stupidity. That sounds a bit horrible of me to say that, but uh, you know, he just wanted them to do what he wanted them to do and not be obsessed with what they looked like. <laughs> Yes, Lucio's sadistic side uh, is all part of the legend and I experienced that mainly uh, directed towards me in Paura, the fear. The scene in the coffin when we were shooting in De Paoli's and they were close-ups on my face and despite the fact now that I, I love that scene in fact, uh, uh, at the time it was quite, it was pretty hard to do and uh, there was this moment when I, I I realized that you know, everybody was looking at me, the close-up was on me, I was supposed to be dead and I shouldn't be moving. And so I was trying really hard not to move, but despite myself, my eyelashes, my, my eyes were kind of flickering. It was just nervous tension. You know, there was a lot of nervous tension and I couldn't control it. And uh, the more 
Lucha raised his voice and told me to stop moving, the more my eyes were moving. And I was breathing deeply so that it didn't show, uh, because obviously I was supposed to be dead, uh, trying to relax, and you know, my eyes were moving. And uh, so in the end, he wrenched me out of the coffin and he said, look, I'll show you how easy it is. And he got in. So I have this vision of Lucho like this with his glasses on, not with the pipe this time, but with the glasses on, like this, of course, doing it perfectly, lying completely still. <laughs> And then, of course, there was a famous worm scene in the same film where that was the, probably the worst experience as far as my relationship with Lucha was concerned because I was the last one to do the close-up. I can never remember in English what it's called, but in French it's called plan large, so it's a wide shot. Um, it was okay because the worms were, well, it was mostly rice being blown through this wind machine, so it was easy to pretend. Uh, but the close-up was the real worms and uh, I really didn't want to do it because I'd seen the three others doing it before me. So I saw what I was in for and I, I had in those days a kind of aversion to worms despite the fact that Lucio told me what clean insects they were and I shouldn't worry and all of this. And it, that was that my close-up was the last shot of the day and so the producer was hovering because we had to get it in the can. and. Um, I got myself into a bit of a state about this scene and I also decided that everybody else had had a, sc a screaming moment. I didn't scream because it's not in my mentality to scream, but I thought, I, I think I'll have my little tantrum now. It's my turn. And so I started saying I didn't want to do it and I was going to call my agent. And uh, uh, anyway, in the end, uh, the wonderful script lady, Rita Agostini, who was like Lucio's um, soul sister and confidant, she walked me round De Pauli's courtyard. I think I was crying, uh, she was almost crying. Uh, we, was, we were doing this Italian number together. And uh, she was saying, don't worry, it'll all be all right. Um, the wonderful makeup artist, he stuck my T-shirt down with glue, sort of glue so that the worms, I would know the worms couldn't get in. And he put this special face mask, I, I don't know if it was a placebo effect, uh, possibly it was, this kind of cream on my face, transparent, so that I would know that the worms weren't touching my face, they were touching the mask, okay? And they gave me two cognacs and I did it. But the trouble was uh, Lucio let the camera roll and really I thought he had enough footage and by this time I was not acting, I was doing it for real, I was really disgusted and he let the camera roll and roll and roll and I think I was even crying in the end because I realized that he was actually enjoying watching me suffer and I was crying because I couldn't believe that he would do this to me. So yeah, that was the darker side of Lucha Fulci, that's for sure. I like to think that I was a friend of Fulci's, that I was more than just an actress because we did occasionally see each other outside of filming, not uh, tete a tete as they say, not you know just the two of us. That might have been a bit intimidating, uh, but but maybe it wouldn't have been. You know, he, maybe he would have opened up. I mean, I was only 25 or whatever I was, and uh, he was a lot older. Because he, he was quite a shy man when it came to women, despite everything, he was actually quite shy. Uh, the, the occasions, uh, they were mostly with uh, Paolo Malco, in actual fact, who was a very good personal friend of Lucio's right up until the end. Um, the, the situations where we did see each other were usually with Paolo or at Paolo's house, a dinner party. And I guess I felt quite uh, privileged to be in that position. And I'm, I'm happy now to think that uh, there was something outside of just the professional uh, side of things, but it's, it's really hard. I wouldn't really call myself a personal friend, a friend, let's say, but, but then I lost touch with him, you see. I, you know, I went back to, to London and Paris and he carried on and then, of course, he did offer me the, what would have been my fourth movie, the one that he made after House by the Cemetery, and I'd kind of had enough by then. I, I wanted to do something else, but, uh, and, you know, if, I, if I'd carried on, I'm very glad I didn't because I believe that film wasn't so good. I, and I believe it was incredibly violent. That would, I would not have liked that. So I probably would have, I didn't even read it. I, I just said no. But if I'd read it, I think I would have said no. And you, you can have too much of a good thing. Although I didn't realize at the time that it was such a good thing. 
but you can have too much. There's always a time when you, you should stop, you know, before things go downhill. I've tried to give the business up, in actual fact, about, about what, about sort of 13, 14 years ago. And it really was like trying to come off a drug. And I realized that I couldn't do it. I couldn't give it up, that it is so much a part of me, however difficult it is at times. It really is me. So, uh, and, and luckily, the business has kind of came back to me in, in, through Lucio mainly, uh, because quite a few younger directors or not so young directors are beginning to contact me. I, I have to be a little bit careful which projects I accept, uh, and uh, because some of the ones I get sent are really not good at all. And it, I have to, you know, I have to try and keep this uh, status uh, of, of the Fulci icon going. And the only way I'm going to do that is if I do good projects. Friends still uh, send me emails saying, "You won't believe it. The Beyond is on. It's got, well, or various of the films are on British television now, different channels, quite regularly. In actual fact, and, you know, it is it is extraordinary. This um, this legend, this this. Uh, thing that these Fulci films have become, it is worldwide. I, I sometimes tell friends of mine who don't know too much about it, and I think they must think I'm showing off, but uh, it's true, it's worldwide. There's everything in them, this kind of Italian decadence, uh, and this kind of strange semi sort of American movie, but it's not American, it's Italian. Um, there is the, 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 the photography, the, the artwork, uh, the, the, the subject, the gore, the violence, but uh, there is a, a, a poetry to them, which is what I retain first and foremost and what I like about them, uh, despite the gore, which, uh, which I don't like so much, but I realize that they, 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 they wouldn't exist, these films, if they didn't have the gore and the violence. I tried to run away from them because I realized that they, they, they were incredibly violent and uh, I didn't really want my name associated with that. I was a young British actress working in very serious projects in France and, and England. It would have been nice if they'd led to uh, a more European career in so much as it would have been nice to have worked more in Italy and I was hoping that, that they might lead to that because Lucio was very well respected by the business and it permitted those films permitted me to go with the top one of the top Italian agents of the time but it didn't serve any purpose whatsoever because I never got called back to do anything else and uh, well you know the business was in a downward uh, downward mode at the time so um, Italian cinema generally so but you know, I, I, what, what I was hoping that it, it might lead to further work with decent directors in Italy. It didn't, but it's led to a worldwide icon status 30 years later. So, so you know, that's pretty good.